That was the first of our uh, first of this year's uh, brain mapping seminar series. Uh, and, uh, this is a monthly seminar that uh, typically will be in the first Thursday of the month, although there's occasionally a little bit of jitter around that. Uh, it's a real pleasure today to introduce our uh, first speaker, Simon Cherry. Um, I met Simon from many years ago, and uh, having been involved in plant imaging. Uh, Basically, since uh, I came here for residency uh, in the 19, late 1980s, uh, I think one of the things that I always found really attractive about <coughs> that was the sort of unique culture that blends uh, physicists, chemists, uh, uh, biologists, and clinicians uh, in order to get the research work done. And all of those people are absolutely essential. Um, I think that uh, Simon really exemplifies that. Uh, he came here, I think, around it was 1990 or yep. 1991 yep. to work with uh, Ed Hoffman, who uh, was a pioneer in the original design of PET scanners. Uh, and one of Simon's very first papers was a paper entitled uh, 3D uh, PET Imaging uh, Using a Conventional Multi-Slice Tomograph Without SEPTA. Uh, which sounds like a really obscure uh, thing, but it, it is sort of a concept, which is basically if you take a PET scanner apart, a billion some dollar machine, multi-million dollar machine, and put it back together with some of, without some of its essential components, it would be much better. Uh, if you have such an idea for our MRI scanner, uh, come talk to me after. Uh, Simon really took that concept and many other concepts uh, to their ultimate. Uh, he really was a, has been a pioneer in, for example, um, using some th these techniques uh, of, of engineering to uh, improve small animal pet, an area that he's worked for a long time, uh, but ultimately has managed to bring this to the human realm, and that's what he's going to be talking about today. I think he's truly a pioneer in the area of pet instrumentation, and I think that you know we all seek to be have the capability to sort of envision the future and reach into that future and pull it into the present. Simon's been able to do that, and I think a lot of that has to do with this culture of, of really understanding not just physics, uh, but also understanding what's the driving biology that allows him to really bring the right instrument uh, to light at the right time, and he'll be talking us about the latest endeavor in that regard today that uh, pertains to humans. Welcome to Simon Chair. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Roger, for that uh, kind introduction. Of course, it's a great pleasure to be back here at UCLA, actually for the second time in a year. Um, and uh, I had 11 very, very happy years here from 1990 till 2001. Um, and so the, the project I want to uh, talk to you about today is one that's actually been going on for some 15 years and uh, finally um, has, has come to uh, at least some level of fruition. There's still a long way to go, but um, hopefully have some fairly interesting data to show you today. And, and since I'm talking at the brain mapping seminar, I'm going to try and put some of this in the context of where the opportunities relate um, in total body imaging in relation to the brain. And I'd really welcome ideas and thoughts on, on this as we think about possible ways to study uh, brain-body interactions with the technology that I'll talk about today. Um, so first of all, I just need to give you a couple of disclosures. We do have relationships with two companies, uh, Siemens uh, Medical Solutions and United Imaging Healthcare. So I know we have a pretty uh, broad audience in this room. We have some real experts in PET sitting third row back over there and over here as well. And then I suspect there are some people in the audience that don't use PET in their everyday life and so may be less familiar. So if the experts will indulge me for a moment, I'm just going to give a little bit of background first to sort of set up the story for why we did what we did. Um, and why we think it's going to make a difference. So, first of all, positron emission tomography PET is, is based on an absolutely beautiful piece of physics. I just want to share with you uh, for a moment here. So, we take uh, molecules that we're interested in studying in the body and we radio label them. So, we put a radioactive tag on them so that we can visualize them in the body. And the particular radioactive tag we use is, is a radionuclide that decays by positron emission. That's where PET gets its name from. 
And so positrons are the antiparticle to electrons. So we're looking at antimatter here. Sounds like almost like science fiction, but this is something we use in hospitals every day uh, throughout the world. And so when this radioactive tag decays and emits a positron, that positron will travel a very short distance in tissue before it meets up with an electron, and here you have matter and antimatter coming together, and those two particles will annihilate. Their mass will get converted into energy, and the equation that governs that is an equation you all know. It's E equals mc squared, Einstein's famous uh, uh, energy mass equivalence equation. So you can compute the energy that gets produced by just multiplying the mass of those two particles by the speed of light squared. And that energy comes out in the form of um, two photons, very energetic photons, 511 kiloelectron volts of energy each. So that's roughly about five times, five to ten times higher in energy than diagnostic x-rays, just to give you some sense. And these are, these are very energetic, very penetrating radiation that can quite easily pass through tissue and reach external detectors. So that's the physics behind PET. And then we build these PET scanners that have rings of, of, uh, of gamma ray detectors uh, surrounding the patient that collect these, these gamma rays. And we have a range of different labels that we can use to label our, uh, our radio tracers. Clinically, the most common one we use is fluorine 18, which has a half-life of about two hours. So um, one of the big challenges with PET is that you have to be able to synthesize your compound, radio label it, inject it, image, all within the time scale of a few half-lives. So that's always a challenge, and often for the shorter-lived half-lives means you have to have on-site uh, accelerator and radiochemistry <coughs> facilities. For research, we do a lot of things with carbon-11, just because a lot of interesting molecules, organic molecules, contain carbon. So it's relatively straightforward to substitute a uh, naturally occurring carbon-12 atom with a positron-emitting carbon-11 atom and then be able to trace, follow that molecule inside the human body. And then for some slower biological processes, for example, we might be studying the distribution of an antibody over time. We also have longer-lived labels, such as copper-64 and zirconium-89. So we have a range of things we can label with, and a range of things we can label. So with PET, um, particularly looking at this from a research perspective, there is a whole spectrum of different kinds of entities that we can label, all the way from small molecules through larger um, biomolecules such as peptides and antibodies, um, nanoparticles, we can label cells, watch their distribution. So it's an incredibly rich landscape defined by the tracer principle, the idea that we can radioactively tag something and then follow this inside the living human body with very, very small amounts of the radioactive material actually injected, well below pharmacologic levels in general. And the most common thing we do in the clinic is we use this compound FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose. It's a sugar analog and it's labeled with fluorine 18. And we use this um, primarily in oncology for looking at staging and response to therapy. So typically there we'll do a whole body survey and so a very typical whole body PET scan is shown on the right side there. Take perhaps 20 minutes or so um, to acquire. There's also applications of PET in cardiology and neurology as well. And just to give you some figures on use of PET worldwide, there's about um, close to 6 million scans per year being done across the world at about 6,000 different sites, and those are 2016 figures. All right, so that's, that's sort of a little bit of background. And you know, we have these beautiful imaging systems that have been developed by the major companies that work uh, in, in this space. PET, first of all, is almost always now combined with anatomic imaging, either with CT or MR. So we have these hybrid scanners, these PET-CT and PET-MR scanners, so we can both look at the anatomy and we can look at the radio tracer distribution uh, in, the, in the PET scan. And these systems are very sophisticated, been developed by, by superb scientists in, in industry, manufactured to incredibly high standards and produce really, really amazing images. And those of us that have been in the field for a while have seen this evolution over um, you know, three, three decades or so now. The image quality has just got better and better and better. And so I think it's tempting on the PET side to think that we've reached a certain maturity here that perhaps there's not much more we can do in terms of improving uh, the image quality. Which sort of sets up the problem that we were addressing in the Explorer project. 
And so let's think a bit, and let's take our standard clinical pet exam, which is a whole body on oncology study using FDG, and think about how we currently acquire that data. So most of today's PET scanners that are available on the market cover somewhere between 20 and at most 30 centimeters of the body at any one time. So that's the field of view. So if we want to image the whole body, then the way that we do this is that we have to step the subject through and take somewhere between six to eight or so bed positions to cover the whole subject. And so we build the picture up piece by piece. So there's some obvious limitations of doing this. You know, first of all, at any one moment, about seven-eighths of the body is not inside the scanner. So you're just throwing that signal away. Remember, we're, this radiation is not targeted. We've, we've injected these radioactive traces into the body. They're distributed throughout the whole body. They're emitting everywhere in the body. So we're only collecting one-eighth of that at any one time, just based on the field of view. And then even for the part that's in the field of view, a lot of the photons actually escape out the ends of the scanner and we don't detect them. So this is a very, very inefficient geometry for collecting the signal. The other thing is that um, radio tracer distribution inside the body is a dynamic process. And in fact, there's a lot of information in the temporal um, distribution, how things change, how the concentrations of these traces change over time in the different tissues and organs. And if we can only acquire a snapshot of each part of the body at any one time, we can't look at that in a whole body context. We can only study the dynamics of the tracer in one organ at a time, one major organ at a time. So that's another limitation. So while when we compare ourselves to other imaging modalities, we like to say that PET is very high in sensitivity, which it is, um, it's also true, if you've ever looked at PET images, that they are pretty noisy, our signals are pretty low, and we're limited, of course, by the radiation dose that we can reasonably inject into a human subject. And it's actually pretty easy to show that when we're imaging the whole body with this geometry of the current scanners, we actually collect less than 1% of the available signal. So this is not very good. Even after all these years of development with these beautiful scanners, we're throwing away more than 99% of the available signal. And that's what our project was designed to address. Now probably just about everybody in this room knows what the solution is. You take the geometry of the current scanners, which looks like this, and you change it to a geometry that looks like that. The idea has been around for a long time, it's not my idea, but nobody's done it yet. And so why not? Why has nobody taken this approach, which clearly would allow you to collect a lot more of the available signal? And there's a number of challenges in doing this. First of all, the scale of the system gets, uh, it gets pretty, um, complicated. This starts to resemble one of the high energy physics experiments at CERN, just to give you an idea of the complexity of the system in terms of the number of detectors and channels. So we're looking at potentially half a million or so individual detectors to cover the body, many tens of thousands of channels of electronics, all that have to be synchronized in time at the level of 100 picoseconds or so. Perhaps a bigger challenge is the amount of data that this kind of system will produce. So we're in the range of, of data sets, raw data set sizes that go from hundreds of gigabytes up to one to two terabytes per study. And an obvious challenge, which needs to be addressed and thought about, is cost. There's a lot more material, detector material here, a lot more electronics. Obviously the cost is going to, to scale close to the, uh, the increase in the length. And so we have to be thoughtful about the cost to benefit ratio as well. So we put together a consortium to try and um, develop this concept and actually uh, build a prototype. And it actually, um, if successful, it will be the world's first medical imaging system of any kind that can cover the whole body at once. If you think about current CT and MR scanners, for example, you can do whole body imaging, but again, you're stepping the subject through. You, don't, you can't acquire data from the entire human body simultaneously with any other technique right now. So that could potentially open up some interesting applications um, for total body imaging. 
So a little bit of the history. So first of all, um, I have not led this project uh, by myself. Um, equally responsible is this gentleman here, Ramsey Badawi, who's a colleague of mine at UC Davis. Um, so we've co-led this project from uh, its inception. And in fact, the early history of this was that we had just recruited Ramsey to UC Davis um, in 2005. And we were sitting in my office one day thinking about things we could do together. And um, he had been running some interesting computer simulations to look at what would happen if you made PET scanners somewhat longer. So going from what was then current state of the art, which was 10 centimeters coverage axially, and he was simulating what would happen going up to 50, 60 centimeters. And it wasn't obvious that this was a good idea because Things like scatter become more of a problem as you open up this geometry, so we're going to be much more susceptible to scattered photons potentially. And for those of you in the, in the know about PET, we also have something called random coincidences as well. And these are unwanted events, and those also are likely to go up dramatically in this, in this more open geometry. So it was an interesting study to start to look at this trade-off. I was coming at this from a very different angle. As Roger mentioned, we had spent a lot of time working on preclinical imaging uh, systems. And of course, those were total body imaging systems. We were imaging the whole body of a mouse simultaneously or already. And so it was really the marriage of those two, two ideas um, that led us to, to think about tackling this problem, which as I said, had been around for some time, of actually trying to develop, to develop a system to do this in humans. And so, from the first discussions in 2005, first grant submissions went in 2008, we, we brought the University of Pennsylvania and the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab into a consortium in 2011 and had a first meeting with them and a subsequent meeting in the Bay Area, and this is the first picture I have of the group, and those of you in the pet field will, will know many of the people that are in that picture. So that's the early history of the project. So initially, we had no money. So if you have no money, about the only thing you can do is run computer simulations, which is what we did. And we had a graduate student, Jonathan Poon, and I've summarized his entire thesis in a single slide here. Um, and so he, he was tasked with simulating what would happen, what the game would be in signal collection if we made this very long uh, PET scanner. And so the numbers that he showed were that we would get a sensitivity gain for imaging the whole body of about a factor of 40. If we're imaging a shorter subject, for example, a, a pediatric subject, the gain would be roughly a factor of 20. And if we're interested in only a single organ, although why we would only care about a single organ, I don't know, but maybe you guys might be interested. So the brain, for example, even for the brain, we get a factor of five. So you might be asking, well, well why do we get a factor of five increase for the brain? Because that already fits in the field of view of current scanners. And the reason is this. So this is the geometry of the current scanners, and so these are sort of lines of response that we can measure. And you can see with the much longer axial field of view, we can collect many more coincidence lines of response. Our, our geometric acceptance is larger. So even for imaging just a single organ, if I only care about the brain, I'm going to get a factor of five, roughly, increase in signal collection, which is still a, which is still a good improvement. So. Let's take the factor of 40 for whole body imaging, because that's where you get the biggest gain is if you want to image the entire body. And let's think about what we can do with 40 times more signal. So one thing, of course, you can do is you can just collect much better quality data. And so uh, the signal to noise in, in PET goes as roughly the square root of the signal collection. So with 40 times more signal, we'll get about six and a half fold improvement in the signal to noise ratio in our, in our images, which means that we should be able to detect smaller lesions in a, in a clinical scenario, possibly lower grade disease. So uh, areas where we have uh, uh, increased uptake of our radio traces, but not by very much over the surrounding normal tissue. And this could also support doing fast dynamic imaging, and I'll show some examples of that later. Another thing that we get with this increased signal collection is that we can follow our radio traces for longer in time as they're decaying. Remember, they're decaying with the characteristic half-life of the radioactive tag. So with carbon-11, half the signal's d disappearing every 20 minutes. So the signal is disappearing fast, but we have a lot more signal collection capability now. So we can actually follow for about five more half-lives compared to a conventional scanner. So it extends the imaging time window that we have to look at a given radio tracer. Another way, if we collect 40 times more signal, then we could image 40 times more quickly and get the same signal to noise we currently get. 
So this means a 20 minute PET scan can now be done in just 30 seconds. So we could theoretically get a whole body, a decent quality, diagnostic quality see, uh, PET scan of the whole body in 30 seconds. And you know, respiratory motion is one major thing that we, we have a problem with in PET, particularly obviously if we're looking at lesions in the lung. And so you're getting into the range of 30 seconds where you could even do breath hold PET. And the last obvious way you can use this gain in signal collection is to reduce the injected dose that we give to our subjects. So in cases where it would be um, appropriate and useful to do so, we could drop the injected dose to the kinds of levels that you get um, for a transatlantic round trip uh, tr uh, flight from the west coast of the United States to Europe and back. So that's around 0.15 millisieverts for the PET part of the examination. And it also means that we could do 40 scans in an individual for the same dose as they currently receive in one scan. So we have a lot of different opportunities for how to use that gain in signal collection. And that leads to thinking about a range of applications for um, a, a total body PET scanner. So obviously it's well suited for any systemic disease. We already use PET extensively in oncology and we will continue to do so and hopefully increase the range of applications there. But we can use similar paradigms to look at inflammation throughout the body, infection. Um, and then there are other areas such as uh, cellular therapy and, and trafficking. And one we're very interested to look at, which is the interaction between um, the brain and the rest of the body, um, that will probably require some, some new thinking about uh, the relevant radio traces and approaches. An obvious area of application is total body pharmacokinetics, because we can watch our radio tracer in all the tissues in the body over time. So imagine you're a drug company, you have a new drug, you'd like to know its distribution, you'd like to know its concentration at its intended target, you'd also like to know the concentration in other organs where you might have concerns about toxicity. In a single study, we can map out the entire pharmacokinetic profile uh, using a total body scanner. And then the low dose aspect potentially opens up new populations. You know, if we look back to the uh, late 1970s, 1980s, a huge amount of fundamental research was done in PET, uh, with PET in normal subjects to learn about basic physiology, metabolism. And we sort of got away from doing those studies, I think largely because of concerns about radiation dose. And so the ability to now go back and study normal biology using PET, and also use PET perhaps more in chronic disease, because we can do studies at such low dose that we can, we can do many scans in an individual without the dose being a limiting factor. And of course, ex expanded use potentially in the pediatric population as well. So those are some of the, the potential applications. So um, just to give you a couple of examples where we already have um, some leads on some interesting studies that involve the brain and the rest of the body, I'll show a couple of examples for, um, uh, here. So the first is looking at inflammation. So um, there was a preclinical study some time ago that showed in mice, so this was an observation that came out of total body imaging in mice, they were looking at mice following a, a, a model of myocardial infarction and they were looking at the inflammatory response of the heart and indeed they saw an acute inflammation in the heart and then they actually saw during the remodeling of the heart um, eight weeks later they again saw another flare of inflammation as well. But because they had the whole body in the field of view, they, and they were thoughtful, they actually looked what was happening elsewhere in the body. And they also saw there was inflammation happening in the brain as well. So that was in a mouse model, so they then took that into patients. And this was not easy to do because they can't look at the brain and the heart at the same time easily um, in, in the patient population. But they were able to recapitulate the same results. So they took patients post myocardial infarction. So here's, um, here's the perfusion deficit that you see in, in this subject. Here is an inflammation marker with PET, and you see the inflammatory response in, in the re region with low perfusion. But when they looked in the brain of these subjects, and this is averaged over several um, uh, subjects, they were able to see um, some increased uptake of this um, tracer that binds the TSPO, which is implicated inflammation, in the brain as well. So the ability to study these multi-organ inflammatory responses after a, a major insult to the body is something that clearly we could do um, with the system we're proposing. 
Another example of, of some relevance to this audience would be in Parkinson's disease and the debates about the role of alpha-synuclein and its distribution and how that changes over time. So there's quite an effort in, in the PET field right now to develop a tracer for alpha-synuclein. Um, so that work is ongoing, but there are different hypotheses about where it originates and, um, and again, being able to study this in the whole body context, I think, would give some interesting insights into this problem. Problem. So we have an idea, we have some computer simulations that seem to support that idea would be worth uh, pursuing. Um, now we want to actually build the system so that we can actually do some of the studies that I just um, uh, led you through in terms of applications. And of course, the challenge is this, you know, a conventional PET CT scanner costs about $2 million, roughly, give or take, and goodness knows how much a total body scanner will be. And so, one of the reasons this project took a long time is that it's taken us a long time to persuade our colleagues uh, who have been peer reviewing our grants that this is a worthy thing to do. So we have submitted our first grant application in 2008. This was not to build the system, by the way. This was to run computer simulations. So this was not a big dollar grant by any stretch of the imagination. So it did very poorly under peer review, did not get scored. Uh, we resubmitted. We thought we really responded well to the reviewer comments. So we resubmitted in November 2008. And it got triaged again, and I just quote uh, one of the reviewer comments, which was really based around the cost issue again. And, you know, such a high cost, this scanner does not appear feasible as a clinical scanner and not even as a research scanner. So essentially, I mean, this is something you, scientifically you just can't address, this, this kind of comment. And we, we had this many, many times. So then we thought, well, perhaps the Keck Foundation might be into a, a fairly risky project like this. So we tried them, and that didn't work. And then we tried the National Science Foundation, and that didn't work. So we're getting a bit dispirited by now. Three years have passed, as you can see, no money. Uh, fortunately, our graduate student, Jonathan, got a scholarship, so he was paid, and, but he was the only person being paid on this project at the time. Um, now, 2011, we got a stroke of luck. The National Cancer Institute um, had a specific call called their Provocative Questions Call. And one of the provocative questions that you could submit a grant in response to was uh, increase the sensitivity of current imaging methods by a factor of 10. So we were just perfectly suited for this, right? And so we did apply and we did get funded. Now these were not big grants. Again, it was a sort of a planning grant, uh, but it gave us some initial money to start to really uh, develop some of the, the technology ideas um, and to, to, to uh, continue the simulation work. At the same time, our institution gave a fairly significant amount of money to start large multidisciplinary projects within the university, and we were also successful at getting money from them. And Siemens um, had, who we were in discussions with to try and help us with this project, had an old scanner sitting at their factory, an old clinical scanner they didn't want anymore, and so they donated the parts and the electronics from that scanner to us, and I'll show you what we did with that in just a moment. So these were good days, a couple of years of, you know, a bit of progress here. We were able to hire some more people to work on the project. That's when we formed that consortium with the other two institutions as well. Things were going well. We had great data, we thought, supporting that we should now go and build this machine. So we went back to NIH in 2014 with a proposal to actually build a project prototype and we started to run back into those same problems again that we had initially in 2008. So then we tried the Keck Foundation again. We're not people to give up, as you can see from this list. Um, and that failed miserably as well. And then we left the country and went to the United Kingdom to try and get funded. So we went to the Medical Research Council and the Wellcome Trust in the United uh, Kingdom. Um, this was pre-Brexit, so things were good at that time. And um, very interesting review process there. I don't know if any of you have ever uh, gone through the review process in, in, the, in, in the UK for these sort of large um, projects, but we submitted a white paper and then we submitted a formal application and then they have a review session but you actually go there and present with the reviewers in the room. So you're in a small conference room, the 10 reviewers are sitting around the table and you get 15 minutes to present to them, they have 15 minutes to ask you questions and then you leave the room. Then about 30 minutes later the head of the study section comes and gets you, brings you back into the room and gives you the verdict. 
So that was a very bad evening. There were a few drinks in the pub that night, I have to say, because we really thought the fact they'd, they'd paid to fly us over there, they'd brought this committee together just to review this one application. They weren't reviewing anything else. They were just re reviewing this one application. We really thought we must be in with a decent chance of getting funded. So that was a very sad night. But fortunately, uh, in parallel, we had resubmitted to NIH again. A different mechanism, so we submitted to their transformative R01 program, which primarily has reviewers from outside the field who know nothing about pet and nothing about imaging <laughs> and thankfully we were able to pull the wool over their eyes and they thought it was a great idea it got a fantastic score and it actually was the largest of these awards that NIH had ever given so um, so we were very fortunate they, they fully funded the request and so it's funded by the office of the director the National Cancer Institute and, the, and NIBIB the biomedical imaging and bioengineering institute and so then we were off to the races, and so this was, uh, this was good. And there we are, looking very happy at that point. <laughs> Somebody even made us a nice little cake of the Explorer scanner, as you can see. So that was good. All right, so the first thing we did, we had this equipment that we had from Siemens. So this was an old clinical scanner, the MCT scanner, for those of you that, that, that know the Siemens scanners. And what we did is we, we reformatted that scanner. We, we shrunk it by half in diameter, and we made it twice as long. So it's starting to have the geometry that we're sort of interested in. And the idea was that we could study some of the physics issues um, that we were going to encounter, some of the data correction issues we were going to encounter. Um, and this was work done by, by my student, uh, Eric Berg. But we also realized once the scanner was built and we'd done all the physics stuff we wanted to do, it's also a, a beautiful form factor for imaging non-human primates. So we have one of the seven NIH-funded primate centers at UC Davis, about 4,000 rhesus macaque monkeys. A lot of interesting research going on. We actually already do a lot of PET um, uh, there with a, with a commercial scanner. So we installed this system into um, our primate center. And I'll show you just one example We've done hundreds of studies on it. Uh, it's been a very useful platform. But I'll show you one study of potential interest to this audience, which is uh, looking at these new tracers for um, synaptic density. So the, uh, this is a, a tracer that came out of um, uh, the groups in Europe and also work at Yale University. And uh, so this uh, targets the synaptic vesicle isoform SV2A, which is expressed in synapses. It's being used in a, in a lot of neuroimaging uh, research in, in, in humans right now. But uniquely in this setting, what we were able to do was to look at the fetal brain. So um, in, 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 uh, we have quite a, a big program in, um, in uh, maternal medicine at uh, UC Davis at the Primate Center. And so we're able to capture the dynamics of this tracer, not just in the uh, maternal brain, which is what a lot of other people have been doing, but we're actually able to look in the, in the fetal brain um, as well, simultaneously. So this is a nice application for this because we need a large field of view to look at the whole body and to be able to do kinetic analysis across the whole body. So this, this scan has been uh, very, very useful. But now we're ready, to, you know, we've got this nice grant from the NIH, we're ready to build the human scanner. And something occurred to us very quickly, which you know, will be obvious to those of you in this room that have built PET scanners, and I see some people over there that have. So the, the one on the right, the picture on the right here is a, a scanner that was built in my lab a few years ago. It's for imaging the mouse brain. And I put that picture here just to show you when an academic lab builds a scanner, this is what it looks like. There's cables everywhere, right? I mean, you imagine scaling this up to the size of the human body and having something that actually works every day. So, I mean, you do not want an academic lab building a scanner of this scale on their own. So we really wanted to engage industry and get an industry partner that would actually help us with all their manufacturing expertise. And so some of our requirements for that industry partner was we wanted to use technology that was already out in the field. We don't want to put brand new technology into a scanner that's 10 times bigger than anything anybody's ever built before. Because you have to worry about failure rate of parts and things like that, right? And so, so we want something that's going to be very robust and reliable. Uh, we wanted access to their expertise. Manufacturing expertise is a massive amount of software behind a PET scanner that goes into controlling the scanner, doing all the corrections. You're reinventing all of that would be a massive undertaking, so we'd like to get access to as much of that as possible. Of course, all the mechanical design expertise. We, we had a big grant, but not an infinite grant, and so you know, we're still very price sensitive to build something this big, so we need access to technology at a reasonable price. And then the last two points, you know, if NIH gives us this, this very nice grant and we build just one scanner at UC Davis, how does that help the world? How does that help patients? How does that help research? 
only very, very incrementally, right? So we really wanted a company that had the vision that if this project was successful, they would commercialize the system so that others could access it as well, and preferably take it through the FDA 510K approval process so that we could use it clinically as well as for research. So those were our requirements. You know, this is the shopping list we went to companies with, um, and we were greeted with a range of reactions. We had lots of meetings like these ones here in boardrooms, sitting around tables with company executives and scientists. The scientists in, the, in industry were very keen to do this project. The managers, much less so. Um, they didn't see the market, um, and uh, it would, you know, it's. It takes something on the order of about 75 to 100 million dollars to bring a new medical imaging device to market, a PET CT scanner or a PET MR scanner, something like that. So it's a lot of money that you're asking the company to invest. I mean, our NIH grant was 15 million, just to put it in context. So we're asking the company to put a lot of their own money in to do this. Um, so it was a hard sell. And in the end, we actually only found one company that was uh, willing to do this, which is a company called uh, United Imaging Healthcare, a pretty newcomer in, in the field. Um, and they're based in Shanghai in China, although now they're a, um, a global company and they also have manufacturing in the United States in Texas as well. So a little bit about the technology that's in the scanner. So we use arrays of scintillation crystals. This is what detects the gamma rays, converts the gamma rays into visible light. That visible light is picked up by light sensors. We use uh, something called a silicon photomultiplier. We have four of them underneath this crystal array to decode it. We then build this in, into uh, panels. The crystals are small in cross-section, about two and three quarter millimeters. This is what's gonna give us good spatial resolution uh, in our images. And I have a little movie coming up that shows you how the whole scan is put together. Um, here. So here's an individual crystal. That was what we start with. And then we build that into these arrays that go onto the silicon photomultipliers. And then uh, we will uh, build that into a panel. And each panel is about 24 centimeters long. And then we replicate those panels to build one uh, what we call PET unit, which covers 24 centimeters of the body. And then we replicate that another seven times. Um, and now you see we're up at over half a million detectors here. And then we put a high-end CT scanner on the front because we still need the CT information as well, both for anatomic reference and for attenuation and scatter correction of the PET data as well. So that's what the system looks like inside. So uh, scanner construction started in 2017 and the first ring was built and completed and tested and by uh, 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 January um, of the next year, the second ring was done by February 5, and then we visited in May, and when we got there, they said, we have a surprise for you, and the surprise was the system was completely finished. So six months from start to finish, it's just absolutely astonishing that they got it done so quickly. And here it is in all its glory, so just to put some numbers on there, um, over half a million uh, detector elements, um, about 54,000 light sensors and channels of electronics, and we're actually measuring 92 billion different possible uh, lines of response or trajectories through the human body, so very high density of measurements. It's a pretty roomy bore, it's a 70 centimeter clear bore, so we haven't had any issues with claustrophobia, which is one of the things that uh, there were some concerns about. And, and the key differentiating factor here is this one. So the, the PET scanner covers 195 centimeters, so we can image the whole body of just about everybody except for maybe some very tall basketball players. And even them, if we have them put their knees up a little bit, they, they fit as well. So. Um, so we really do get the whole body. It's also a time of flight scanner. Uh, for those of you that know about PET scanners, that's an important char characteristic. And he has pretty reasonable uh, time of flight performance as well. All right, so the first thing you do, you've built this, this, this beautiful new scanner, so you, you throw a phantom in there. And so um, typically when we test PET scanners, we have these, these, these standard test objects that we use to characterize the performance, and we, and we fill them with a syringe with known amounts of activity and make sure we get the right result back. But with Explorer Scanner, we have a whole different scale to deal with. So we have phantoms that look like this, because you want to image the whole field of view, right? And we don't usually dress this well for phantom experiments. <laughs> by the way, it's just um, 
just for the photo. In fact, we don't even do phantom experiments anymore, me and Ramsey. It's our students and postdocs that do them, so they should, they should get all the credit. And to fill the phantom, we have to use a forklift, because you can't mix it once it's in there. It's too heavy, so you pre-mix the radiation safety. I love this picture. So you pre-mix <laughs> the activity in that large vat there, and then shake it up, and then with the forklift, moving the forklift up and down to shake it up, shake it, and, and mix it, and then you fill the phantom from there. So just everything gets more complicated with this system, even even the phantom experiment. So this is the very first image of that phantom. Um, you know, it's the very first scan, so there are some artifacts in there you can, you can, you can see. You can probably see that, that, that uh, calibration artifact there pretty clearly. But you know, overall, not, not bad for the very first image. And then we, we carried on imaging this cylinder as the activity decayed away, and here we're at incredibly low act levels of activity, and we still have enough signal that we can get a noisy, but still an image. The spatial resolution on this system is, is very good because we have these small crystals. So there's a standard test we have to use in the field that's actually not particularly helpful in my view, but with that test we get about three millimeter spatial resolution. But if we use the, the algorithm we actually use in clinical practice, we're probably closer to about two and a half millimeter resolution. And if we had the computational power, we can even do better. So this is a very advanced reconstruction that models all the physics very nicely. We don't have the computational power to do this yet on the system in any reasonable amount of time, but it shows us extra resolution we could squeeze out if we could. But where this scanner really um, differentiates itself from everything else, of course, is in the sensitivity. And so this is the standard test that's done on, on scanners. And it only uses a source that's 70 centimeters long because they never envisaged that somebody would build a scanner longer than that. So it's not the greatest of tests for us. And, but our value using this standard test comes out to a sensitivity of 174,000 counts per second per mega becquerel of activity. To put that in context, if you buy any scanner from any of the other companies right now, the, the number is in this range. And if we actually do a source that extends throughout the whole field of view, so a two meter long source, then our number comes out to be this, and the industry range is predicted to be around uh, this number here. So a big, big difference, and it's, it's around that, close to that factor of 40 that we had predicted. All right, so now our next problem is a political one. So you didn't think that Donald Trump would figure in this talk, right? But unfortunately, he does. So just before we were due to ship the scanner from the factory in Shanghai to the United States, the second round of tariffs got imposed, which included all medical imaging equipment. Um, and even though this you know, was funded by the NIH, even though more than half the cost of the components in the scanner came from outside of China. Most of it came from the US and some from Europe. We're still tariffed on the whole uh, cost of goods when this scanner came in to the country. And so there was actually a formal process for applying for exemptions with a deadline. So it's like writing a grant application. The deadline was October 9th of last year, so we had to write a whole application explaining why we thought they should exempt the Explorer scanner from the tariff. And um, we applied on several grounds, you know, m mostly based on the, on the benefits to healthcare in the United States. And then you wait, and it goes through multiple rounds of review by different people, and actually, uh, this is the first time I've been able to put this line on the slide, because just three days ago, we got finally the official exemption. Now, in the meantime, we brought the scanner into the country, so we paid the tariff. Now we have to argue with the federal government to get the money back, so that, I'm sure that's going to take another year or two, but um, anyway. So this is something that came in along the way that we, we just did not anticipate, of course, and was another problem for us. So here's the installation, which happened in May 2019. We have a little time-lapse video here where you can actually watch the system going in. It only took about uh, three days to install, so it went very, very fast, as you will see. Um, slightly sped up here. And there it is in its new home uh, in Sacramento. And there with the floor finally finished and um, a few of the uh, performance specs. All right, so now onto the stuff you really want to see, which is what can we do with it? Let's actually do some human imaging. So our first research study was on June 20th of this year 
And um, so the, everything we've done so far, unfortunately, is, well, not unfortunately, but just the way things work out is with FDG. So that's what we have most easily accessible. Of course, the power of this is to do lots of other traces, but we're not there yet. We just got our first IND a few weeks ago, so hopefully we'll be doing some other more novel radio traces soon. So uh, here's our first uh, subject. So remember, this is head to toe in one shot. So this, you know, we capture the whole body simultaneously here. This is a pretty standard injection, close to 10 millicuries, and a pretty standard imaging time. So we're going for image quality here. And I think that's apparent in, 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 in the wealth of detail that you can see in, in, in this image. And if we zoom in on a few sections here, so the top ones might be of interest to you. So images of the brain here. So we see pretty high uh, spatial resolution uh, in the brain, although this subject did move somewhat. So we, we haven't got motion correction in there yet. It's one of the things we, we need to add for the brain. But some of the things that are striking, for example, are you see the chambers of the heart beautifully here. You see the descending aorta. You also see the vessel walls are slightly hot here. This is uh, something that we see in all of our subjects. Uh, so it's not vasculitis. This is just uh, that we do get uh, increased FDG uptake in, in the vessel walls. This is also why you see the vasculature so well here. This is not blood activity. This is vessel wall activity. Um, if you look at the liver, you get some sense of how good the signal to noise is. You know, it's really uh, pretty uniform, which is nice. And if we look down at the knee joints here, we can see a little inflammation going on in the knee joints. It's a fairly elderly subject, as you can see. All right. So the, the first thing that hits us immediately when we do this research study, which was actually a dynamic scan, um, so we acquired lots of data, was yeah, just the amount of data that we have to deal with. So um, that scan that I just showed you, which was actually, we started off with a 60 minute dynamic scan, we're getting you know, on the order of one and a half to two terabytes of raw data that we then get to reconstruct. And we'd like to save that raw data to use if we improve our reconstruction methods in the, in the future. So we have a pretty high end, um, cluster to store the data and process the data. In fact, we have two of them now. Uh, but even those running in parallel, we're, we're really struggling to keep up with the amount of data we're producing, particularly in these early stages when we want to reconstruct things many different ways. Um, so that's something that is still a bottleneck and we're still working on. All right, so um, let's get back to some of the claims that we made, and I'll show you some qualitative data that I hope address some of these claims. So first of all, higher signal-to-noise ratio. So this is a study we actually did back in the factory in Shanghai before we shipped the system under a local hospital IRB in, in, in China. Um, and the nice thing about this was we had the Explorer scanner ready, and next door we had one of the company's regular PET CT scanners, and so we could move the subject between the two. Um, and so this is the Explorer image in the, in the center. Um, on either side, you have the conventional scanner. This one is with the standard uh, reconstruction protocol for the conventional scanner. This one is trying to match the spatial resolution of this image. You'll see it's reconstructed in one millimeter, one millimeter voxels. So that the resolution is matched in between these two. And the things I want to draw your attention to are this little area of focal uptake that we clearly see on the Explorer scanner, but you'd really have a hard time seeing on the conventional scanner. And then if you look up in the liver, you'll notice that there's a potential hotspot here. You also see it here. Is that a real hotspot or is that just noise? Well, again, if you look at the Explorer scan, the liver is just beautifully smooth here, and so you see that that's most likely noise. So that's just an early indication that you know, we've got a better differentiation between signal and noise using the high sensitivity of the Explorer scanner. Now, what about imaging out late? So this is FDG again, so two hour half-life. This is the same subject brought back multiple times over the course of 12 hours. So at this point here, there is about 100 microcuries left in the body. And that's about what we typically inject into a mouse for a preclinical study. So there's a tiny amount of activity, and yet we still get reasonable images. Certainly they're much noisier than the earlier scans, not surprisingly, but still, I mean, if you wanted to look at organ level uptake, you could quantify that very well off a scan with that kind of quality. So it means we can look out much later with our radio traces. What about fast imaging? Well, here's the 20-minute scan that I've already shown you. Here's just one minute of data, and here's 30 seconds of data. So we made the claim that we could image the whole body in 30 seconds, and this is not a bad quality scan here. 
Certainly, again, it's not as good as the 20 minute one. And actually, if we go in and look at actual slices rather than maximum intensity projections, because which sometimes can hide the noise, we go in and actually look at individual uh, coronal slices. Yeah, you can see the noise level on the liver is increasing here, but it's still, still a pretty nice quality scan. So let's just um, look at the brain a little bit. So these are 20 minute FDG scans of the brain. And the brain wasn't optimally positioned here because this was a whole body scan. So the brain's towards the end of the scanner, which is not where the sensitivity is the highest, but still pretty nice. And if we go down to five minutes, again, get a little bit more noisy, but, but not bad. So I think there is the promise that we can do pretty rapid brain imaging. And particularly, this will be an advantage when we do kinetic imaging, dynamic imaging for, um, uh, to estimate uh, specific uh, uh, parameters in kinetic modeling. And then here's a low dose example. So now we're at one t almost 1 20th of the standard dose. We've injected uh, just 0.6 millicuries, 21 megabecquerels into this individual. This is a 20 minute scan, 90 minutes post injection. So again, you know, it looks pretty nice. Brain images, you know, here at, uh, 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 1 18th of the dose are really quite good. So this, this concept that we could do very low dose brain imaging in normal subjects or in pediatric subjects, I think is, is a reality with this system. Now, those are all things that we can perhaps do better with the system than current scanners. Here's something you cannot do on today's systems, which is to watch the distribution of a radio tracer over time in the whole body. So you're going to watch injection of FDG into a vein in the leg here, and you're going to watch it distribute through the, throughout the entire body. Time is on the top. And so here you're seeing the, the delivery to the lungs, first of all, back to the heart, and then the arterial phase. I'll let this play a couple of times so you can watch it. Um, at three minutes here, you're going to see the kidneys light up and excrete into the bladder. That's about to happen. There we go. So you, you see that process occur. And then as we go on in time, you're starting to see the, the typical FDG uptake pattern with the, the brain and the, the heart and the liver. So I'll just play that first part again just so you can watch. So we're taking images here at a rate of one per second. So we're imaging the whole body every second. And we can do that in the early phase because the activity is only in a, in a very small part of the body. It's in the vasculature. So we have very high signal to noise. So we can image incredibly fast across the whole body. And so this is, I think, is going to open a lot of avenues, just something we have not been able to do before. And of course, you, that means you can do kinetic modeling on the whole body. We have the concentration of the tracer in every tissue and organ of the body over time. So we get these curves for every organ, and indeed we get these curves for every voxel, every cubic millimeter in the body. And so we can then apply kinetic models. And one of the other things um, I should mention is, of course, for those of you that know about the, the modeling, one of the things we need to know is the delivery of the radio tracer from the bloodstream. So we need to know the concentration of the radio tracer in the blood as a function of time. And often the way you have to do that is you have to take blood samples. You have to take arterial blood samples out of your research subject. But here, we've always got the, oops, I went the wrong way. We've always got the descending aorta and the ascending aorta in the field of view. So we can actually measure the blood activity off the images. No matter which organ we're actually interested in, we've always got the blood pool there. Okay? And so these are curves here from different arteries, femoral, brachial, carotid, and from the aorta and from the left ventricle. You can see the delays, so we can correct for the different arrival time of the blood at different tissues and organs. We can see the dispersion. So there's a lot of information in this very fast dynamics at the early stage that we can then use in our kinetic modeling. And so these are some of the individual one second frames, two seconds apart, just to show you um, the quality that we can see. And you know, clearly you're seeing the blood pool here in the chambers of the heart and in the aorta, descending aorta, and then the femoral arteries here and how it evolves over time. And then we can put all this information into our kinetic models and we can actually calculate uh, parameters. In this case, we're calculating the influx rate of glucose um, uh, into the tissues. It's a, it's a parameter called Ki, which is given by this combination of parameters. You don't have to worry too much about the details, but the point is here that every voxel in the body, we have computed the value of this rate constant and plotted it in quantitative units. So we're able to do this total body parametric imaging. So we can measure glucose metabolism, we can measure perfusion, we can measure receptor occupancy, binding potential, all these things we can measure in every voxel in the body by applying these kinetic modeling techniques to our total body uh, data. 
And here's a cross section of that parametric map in the brain. So this is not uptake now. This is actually you know, the influx rate of glucose into the brain tissue in quantitative units. Um, now, beyond FDG, um, you know, one of the things we're very interested in, do in doing is establishing methods for total body perfusion imaging. Um, wide range of applications, many processes in which um, uh, perfusion is altered. And for that, we're looking at a tracer called carbon 11 butanol. It's actually um, uh, an alcohol. It's very highly diffusive in, in tissue. And so we've been prototyping this in non human primates right now. And so, again, we do, you know, we do this kinetic analysis and we can actually produce maps of blood blood flow or perfusion across the entire body and we'll be hopefully translating that into humans fairly soon. So my, my last uh, couple of slides here is now thinking about pushing the temporal resolution even further. Once we saw that we could collect images in one second of the whole body during the initial injection phase, we thought about well, what, what happens if we go even shorter. So uh, here are images, again, FDG, total body. So these are the longer scans. This is 30 seconds. This is 10 seconds of scanning fairly soon after injection, so six minutes or so. This is a one second frame, which I'd shown you previously, but here's just 100 milliseconds of data. So from 21.9 to 22 seconds after injection, so 100 milliseconds of data, and we still can reconstruct the activity distribution fairly well. And we've now combined that with advanced reconstruction methods, where we're also doing some regularization in the temporal domain to improve the signal to noise quality. And so we go from images that look like this with 100 millisecond frames to images that look like this. And we can now put that together in a movie. And I'm going to show two movies side by side here, one at uh, the one second temporal resolution and one at the uh, point one. Actually, I lied, that's coming on the next slide. What I'm first going to show you is why we want a better temporal resolution. So typically when we do dynamic imaging with PET, we take sort of 10 second frames at the beginning of a study. And if we map out the time course of the activity, it looks like this. So we're obviously undersampling the information that's there. At one second, we get really nice curves and it looks like we're really following the temporal distribution very nicely. So you might think that that's good enough, but it's very interesting what happens when you go down to 0.1 seconds. Now, if you look at the blood activity in, in the chambers of the heart and the ascending and descending aorta, you see the structure in here, right? And of course, what we're seeing here is the positile nature <coughs> of the heart and the fact that you know, it's not a continuous function. You get tracer come into the, into, into the ventricle, mix with the blood, and they get pumped out. And so the, the activity concentration does not vary continuously over time. And also, if we put a region of interest on the myocardium, which is moving, we can clearly pull out the cardiac cycle as well. So, and that's now, here's the movie I promised you. So to so watch the movie on the right, and you'll see, you'll see the radio tracer mixing in the, in the chambers of the heart and also being pumped out of those chambers because we now have the temporal resolution to do it. So here's, first of all, the phase where it goes to the lung. And now the activity is going to come back to the left ventricle, which you're about to see now. And so now you can see the left ventricle pumping that blood out into the uh, uh, arterial system. Okay. So there's nothing intrinsic that limits the temporal resolution of PET except signal to noise. And so now we're able to show that in certain instances, we can get a 100 millisecond temporal resolution using PET. And obviously, there's some interesting things I think we can do with that. So that was my uh, final slide. We've, we've come an awfully long way since the early days of PET. That's, this is the very first FDG scans on the left-hand side that were done at the University of Pennsylvania to the scans that we can do today on the Explorer scanner. And of course, this took a huge, huge team to realize this project over 15 years. I'm just a small part of it. Um, I, I want to thank um, particularly the people at United Imaging. They had over 70 engineers work on this project for the last two and a half years, and they've really built an absolutely amazing, amazing scanner. Great team of people at UC Davis um, who've gone through all the trials and tribulations over the years of this project. We have a fantastic group of techs now at the center who are running all these studies. And I particularly want to thank my, my colleague, Ramsey Badawi, who's been just a great um, friend and colleague to work with on this project for the last 15 years. And, also, of course, thank NIH for the funding. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. I'll save my more stupider questions for when we meet. <laughs> um, but in, terms of, like, in thinking 
thinking about this, uh, for kids, you know, we're still imaging kids, epilepsy protocol. Yeah. I mean, it, can we get to the point where we're doing a, an unsedated scan? Yes, we want to. So I think uh, so. So if you if you if you're okay with giving a reasonable injected dose, so we can get the scan time way down, then then yes, I think I think we can. It's one of the things we're very interested to explore, and um, so. You know, one of the things that we're looking at is developing software where you, know, you could potentially put an unsedated kid in the scanner for a period of a, a few minutes, okay? But then you only pull out, you know, if you can just find five or 10 seconds within that three minutes where they don't move very much and then you pull that data out. You know, and, and I think it's very feasible to do something uh, like that. So the thought is that, yeah, in the very youngest kids, you know, the, the, the big thing you want to avoid is sedation and general anesthesia, right? And I think we have a method to do that now. And then once the kids are old enough that they can stay still, then you drop the injected dose way down. And, and, and um, even the idea that you could get it, even in a kid who's having tons and tons of seizures, you can get an injury. Right, right. Absolutely. So it's, it's a great application. It's obviously not the easiest space to work in, but it's something we want to do. So this is just a my question, the directionality of imaging. Uh, so, so one way to do it is, I guess, time sequences and time lapse uh, acquisitions. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, does PET lend itself to acquiring direction? To a direction of the, the tracer or, or the, the directionality of, uh, so when you're talking about perfusion, for instance. Right. Yeah. So can you get the piece? So, so I mean, what you what you're measuring with the perfusion measurement is, I mean, you're measuring, you know, you know, the delivery of that tracer per gram of tissue per minute. I mean, that's those are the units for for perfusion. So you're not looking at blood flow, flow right. at, at, at a macro level where you also be looking at direction of flow, but you're looking at tissue perfusion here in, in this case. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, O15 water is what you know traditionally is used for this. Is the gold standard for this in PET. I mean, the problem with O15 water is, you know, you've got a two minute half life. So your cyclotron has to be right next to the scanner. We currently do not have a cyclotron right next to the Explorer scanner. So we can't do oxygen-15 water, which is why we're looking at carbon-11 butanol right now. That also has some advantages, actually. You have a bit of a longer time to work with, but also it's more linear with flow than, than water is. Um, and, um, and also carbon-11 actually um, has a, a, a technical point, but it has a shorter positron range, so the resolution of the images is better as well. Yeah. yeah so, so what is the estimated cost? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you the phone number of the company because I don't know. Well, are they going to develop other systems for research? So, so I mean, so we, we can do the math together, right? So, a regular scanners, ballpark two million ish or so. Okay, this is about eight times the material, but we don't need eight CT scanners as well. So, and there's a little bit of economy of set scale, but not a huge amount. So that will tell you that you're going to be probably somewhere in the 10, 12-ish million range, okay? But I don't know what they're actually quoting people. So, you know, this, this is just, you know, rough calculations, knowing how much material's in there and, you know, what you might anticipate. So cost is a big issue. Um, so... But you have to place that in the context of, of possible benefit and also how you're using it. You're using it clinically, research both. We're trying to do both at our place. So we have started a clinical service using the system. And so we're using it clinically about half the time. Um, so there, if you have the volume, you can have really high throughput because you can image very quickly, okay? So the number of patients you can do in a day is, is potentially a lot more. But is that what you want to do? Because you could keep the imaging time the same as it is today and get much better image quality. Isn't that the better thing to do for the patient? So I mean, there are all these questions that we have to address. And then, of course, you know, this is the cost of the first system. Competition is coming. There's at least one other company, possibly two, that are starting to develop systems that look like this. There's also a lot of work in ac academic labs thinking about how to bring the cost down. You know, the cost is in one or two key components. So we know where the cost is. So I think there are a lot of pressures that hopefully over the next few years will bring the cost down. But at the moment, this is a very expensive 
solution. <laughs> there are so many ways that this is an improvement that I think people are going to be grappling for years with where the real payoffs yeah, are. Yeah. What, what's been the most excited groups in terms of the applications and that you've encountered so far? Um, yeah, I would say um, infectious disease is an area that's garnering a lot of attention partly because there are some new um, radio traces in that space that look very interesting that are just going into humans, partly because in many cases the signals are pretty low and you need to look at the whole body. So I think that's an application space where a, a, a lot of things um, could happen. I think the, the brain body appli uh, applications as well are a lot of interest, but we don't have the right traces to address a lot of those questions right now. So that's going to be interesting, but that, that's going to take a, a lot of development, I think. Um, so I think that those are some of the areas. I think on the, sort of on the methodology side, pushing this really fast temporal resolution imaging with short-lived traces to really get at some of the physiology. And you can imagine you know, uh, organ function tests looking at the, you know, the kidneys, the lungs. You, know, you could do very rapidly at very low dose potentially with good image quality. So there may be some things to come out of that, that very rapid dynamic imaging. So, it's a few, few thoughts. Can yeah. I just redirect that question to limit it only to basic research? So, obviously, the clinical applications are yeah. outstanding. But for basic science, like what can't you do with the preclinical imaging that you might do here, you know, mouse to human differences, and, and might, you know, because just those rate of uptake, if you had those for many, many metabolites, that would be a great resource. Right, and I think you know the, the preclinical platform is obviously a good place to be testing a lot of things that we want to do here. And in fact, I would I would argue that perhaps in the preclinical field, which you know I'm guilty of because I was in that field for a long time, we did not exploit the total body nature of preclinical imaging. You know, there's so many studies in the literature where you know they're imaging the brain or they're imaging the heart or they're imaging a tumor. There's very few examples of people that look systemically in the body with preclinical PET, even though we could see the whole mouse. So. Um, so I think now, in hindsight, I wish we'd done some more things in that space because we'd, be we'd be better prepared to use this scanner if we had. So interestingly, with quite a few ideas, we're going back to start at the preclinical level because that's where we need to start. So what's the interest of the pharmaceutical companies uh, right now? Very interested. AMPD. Yeah, so, you know, <laughs> So obviously this is a terrible scanner to participate in multi-center trials because it's so different than anything else, but it's an excellent scanner to get an early look at total body pharmacokinetics. So a lot of companies are coming to us wanting to do a pretty small scale study to look at their distribution um, of their compounds and particularly in oncology we're seeing this. Um, so they want to also look in cancer patients and look at the kinetics of their compounds in, in tumors. So yeah, we have I mean, I'm probably doing two or three conference calls a week right now with pharma on different projects, and who knows which ones will come to fruition, but yeah, there's a lot of interest. All right, well, we will start saving up for our... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so in the meantime, continue to admi admire the amazing work that you've been doing. Thanks so Thanks, much. Roger. Thank you.